Our first scripture reading this morning starts in Exodus chapter 33, verse 17, and goes to verse 8 of chapter 34. So Exodus 33, 17 to 34, verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I'm pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you on a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone, two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshipped. And our second reading is James chapter 1, verses 2 to 20. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 20. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Then, after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits he created. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. <clears throat> so hopefully you're listening closely to the children's story this morning, because in a nutshell, that's our message. So we're just going to pack up and head to Tim Hortons. No, I'm not going to let you get away with that easy. We've been going through what the Bible teaches us concerning the image of God and man. And in a big picture sense, what we've seen is this, that when we look back at the beginning, at the time of creation, God had his image created in us, implanted in us in a way that was good. There were no flaws with it but it was incomplete. So in other words, it was kind of like looking through a bit of a blurry lens. You couldn't quite see all the details. You couldn't see everything or all the fullness of God. Then after the fall of mankind, that image became horribly marred and blurry to the point where it can be even almost impossible to discern now. But then after the return of Christ, we see that it's going to be complete and perfect because the Bible teaches us that when Jesus returns, we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. And in the meantime, 
what we've learned is that the Holy Spirit is transforming us step by step into perfect Christ-likeness so that we will, in fact, be like Jesus perfectly when he returns. And we've been reminded time and again that this is entirely a work of the Spirit of God. In 2 Corinthians, we read, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. And our focal point over the last few weeks has been looking at the passage in Galatians that talks about this fruit of the Spirit. And remember that what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter 5 is this battle that's going on within us, this spiritual battle where the Holy Spirit is transforming us more and more into that image of God in Christ. But on the other hand, we're still living on in the flesh and we're fighting and struggling and continuing to try to live our own way. And so he lists a number of things that help us to see when we're winning, the flesh is winning and the spirit is not, and other times when the spirit is winning. And so we've been looking at the fruit of the spirit from the point of view that as the Holy Spirit bears the fruit of God in us, really every one of those things on the list is a different characteristic of God. And so this brings us up to where we are now. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience. So patience is where we are today. And so as we've been doing, we're going to look at this idea that the fruit of the Spirit is patience. And over the past few weeks, what we've done with each of the words is at least as a starting point, we've gone to our friend dictionary.com and looked at what does the word mean in English. So when we look at the word patience in English, we see three definitions. First one is the quality of being patient. Okay, it's kind of a circular definition, doesn't tell us anything. But then the rest of the sentence clarifies. As the bearing of provocation, so bearing when you're provoked. As the bearing of annoyance, putting up with being annoyed. Bearing with misfortune, bearing with pain, without complaint, without loss of temper, without irritation, or the like. Second definition, an ability or willingness to suppress restlessness or annoyance when confronted with delay. We tend to want things when we want them and how we want them. Patience is not doing that. And then thirdly, quiet, steady perseverance, even-tempered care, diligence. And that's working away in a way that's hard. You're, you're being patient in your work. You're, you're putting care into your work. The word in Galatians 5, where we see the fruit of the Spirit is patience, that word itself sometimes carries the second meaning, the idea of not wanting things when we want them, but being content to get things in God's time, not our own time. Certainly carries that sometime, and that most certainly is a biblical idea expressed throughout. In fact, when we looked at the Exodus story a couple of years ago, that was one of the main themes was the lack of patience that the people had, and they kept grumbling. We don't like this. We don't want that. We want this now. We want that now. So while that's all true, that's not the point of this morning. And the third one about working way diligently and patiently, that too is, is biblical, but it's not the point of this morning. See, the word that's translated patience in our passage this morning, the fruit of the Spirit is patience, most of the time in the Bible carries the first meaning. And that is putting up with, bearing with being provoked, being annoyed, putting up with misfortune, putting up with pain, and all of it without complaining, without losing our temper, without even getting irritated, and so on. And more so when that word is used with respect to God, that's always what it means. So when we flip over from looking at the English dictionaries to taking that word that we've translated as patience, the fruit of the Spirit is patience, and we look at what the Greek lexicons say, I've pulled definitions out of three different ones that will reaffirm for you, this is really the idea. So the first one, an emotional, a state of emotional calm in the face of provocation or misfortune and without complaint or irritation. Notice how that's a perfect match for our first English definition. Second Greek lexicon says, patience, forbearance, long-suffering, slowness in avenging wrongs. <clears throat> in fact, that slowness, that, that long-suffering, that's how the King James translates it. So for those of you who are used to the King James Bible, you'll see it often as, as long-suffering. And then the third definition up here, patient, long-suffering, slow to anger, and then they note often of the Lord. The third definition, interestingly enough, is from the Old Testament Greek, the Septuagint. And when you look throughout the Old Testament, you'll often see, almost all the time, see that word translated as slow to anger. And so I would suggest that when we run into it, when we run into this word patience, we should be, first of all, thinking the idea slow to anger, unless context tells us difference. Maybe context tells us to put up with not getting our way in the time we want it. But generally, we ought to look at patience in the Bible as being slow to anger, because the vast majority of the time, that's the idea that's being conveyed. 
So then if this slowness to anger is fruit of the Spirit, it must be an attribute of God. In other words, it must be a very characteristic of God himself, which the Holy Spirit living within us is communicating to us. So let's look at this idea of the slowness to anger of God, and you'll start to see just how perfectly a fit this morning's children's story was with this message. And I promise you there was no collusion with Deb. We were completely independent in putting these together. It's another example of how God, and Carolyn has seen this, how God independently is, is getting the same message across. So when we think about this idea of patience, or more, more specifically slowness to anger as being a characteristic or an attribute of God, we can see that it's directly related to what we talked about last week, and that was his impassibility. And remember when we talked about that, that meant God is not subject to passions. It did not mean, as we noted, God doesn't have emotions, because he clearly does. The Bible shows God as expressing joy, as expressing anger and delight and so on. So it's not that God doesn't have emotions, it's rather that God's emotions are perfect. Our problem is we're subject to our emotions. They flare up for good or for bad. They take us over. They consume us. And we're driven by our emotions. And even though rationally we know what we're thinking and what we're about to do is completely wrong, our emotions carry us away. The idea with God is that's the opposite. His emotions are perfect, and they're completely rational, and they're fully subject to his will. And when we think about this slowness to anger, and we think about it with respect to God, ultimately this is a, if not the, key component to the outworking of his love. And remember, love is not just what God does, love is what God is. And so when we see the patience of God, when we see the slowness to anger of God, what we're really seeing is the love of God. And so we're really getting a taste of that love of God. So just a couple of different passages to show us this idea of God being slow to anger. In Nehemiah chapter 9, the context here, what's happening here is the people have returned from exile they're rebuilding the city, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the walls, rebuilding their lives after being away for a long, long time. And they realize why they were away. They were away because they didn't keep God's law. They were kicked out of the land. They were kicked out of Israel because they refused to be faithful to God. Now, in his forbearance, he's brought them back, hoping to have taught them the lesson. And what we're reading here in these couple of verses, well, this, this one verse, Nehemiah 9.17, is a part of a prayer that was led by the Levites, so by the priests, leading the whole people of Israel in a prayer of repentance. And in the midst of it, reflecting back on the history of the Exodus, the prayer includes these words. And they refused to listen and did not remember your wondrous deeds which you had performed among them. So they became stubborn and appointed the leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, and there I have an underlined slow to anger, and right there is literally that word that we have as translated patience in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is patience, and that is the exact word. Slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, and you did not forsake them. See, because God was slow to anger, he was angry with them, and he was right to be angry. They had rebelled against him in horrible ways, but because he was slow to anger, he didn't give them what they deserved. He gave them what they did not deserve. So as Deb said this morning, it's good for us that God's not fair. If God was fair to us, we'd be in a world of trouble. So God wasn't fair to them, and that was a good thing. Then the first verse of our call to worship this morning, our call to worship started in Psalm 103, verse 8, where we read, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. See, compassionate and gracious, gracious and compassionate. Notice how these words are all occurring together. Slow to anger, exact same word once again, and abounding in loving kindness. And again, the same concept. It was the the theme of praise and worship in the Old Testament. Carrying on with this idea about God being slow to anger and how that resulted in the people not getting what they did deserve, but out of God's graciousness, his compassion, his loving kindness, they got what they didn't deserve, and that was mercy and deliverance. Think about the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 2 where he's talking about God working through the gospel, and he says this, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and his forbearance? There's that forbearance, long-suffering. And here is our exact word again, and patience, and slowness to anger, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. In other words, this very slowness of God to anger is embodied in him leading us to repentance. Where he could leave us turned over to ourselves and just bring punishment on us, he doesn't. He brings us back to himself, collecting us in his wings, as the Bible gives the image. But in, it, we're going to see how this specifically ties into our theme right now, and that's the image of God, as we look at our first reading this morning. So our first reading this morning, Exodus, which was Exodus 33 into verse 34, 
Some of you may remember that we read that exact passage a couple years ago when we looked at the Exodus story. And historically, that came right on the heels of the golden calf episode. So remember, Moses is high on top of the mountain, face to face with God, getting the law, getting the covenant, the, the pattern, the rules, the guidelines for the loving relationship between God and his people. And all that time while he's up there, the people in the camp are getting restless. They're thinking, we kind of want to go back to Egypt. They went to Aaron and said, we don't know what's happened to Moses. We don't know what's going on. Make us, make us a God to lead us. So Aaron, Aaron did. And God had said to Moses, you need to get down there. The people are rebelling, and I'm going to destroy them. And Moses, to paraphrase, basically said, calm down, God. It's not that bad. It'll be okay. I'll go deal with it. And as Moses walked down, he saw what was going on, and Moses had a giant hissy fit, smashed the tablets of stone on the ground, and he reacted out of anger when God himself really didn't right away. So God really had reason to be angry. And there was judgment brought on people within the camp. But even when we looked at the Exodus story, those times where the ground opened up and swallowed people, where poisonous serpents came through, when fire consumed people, that wasn't God being vindictive. That was God cleaning out the bad element for the protection of the majority. Because the majority would not safely get into Egypt if, those, if that evil minority was able to have their influence. That was the long suffering of, of God. So in the context of that, Moses was starting to get concerned. He was starting to think, I, well, it wasn't the first time he thought this, but he once again thought, I can't do this. I can't lead this people onto the promised land. This is too big for me. I'm just not up to the job. And so then he asked God, I need something from you. I need you to show me that really you're going to be with me, that really you're going to lead us safely to the end because I just can't continue on. And so what we saw was that Moses asked God to reveal his glory. Verse 18, Moses said, I pray thee, show me thy glory. Moses thought if he could see the beauty of God, the fullness of God, the splendor of God, if he could see God's face, that that would be all that he needed. That would give him the strength he needed. That would send him on his way. But once again, God, out of his love for us, doesn't always give us what we ask for because a lot of times what we ask for would destroy us. And so God's answer is no. Okay, there were more words to it than that, but in effect it was no. Because God said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. So imagine if God had have answered his prayer. Think about all the times our prayers don't get answered, and we think, well, what's happening? Is my faith not big enough? I, I mean it for good. I, I really seriously want this for good purposes. But God knows more than we do, and sometimes when he doesn't give us what we ask for, that's the best way he could answer our prayers, and that's the case here. And then God continues saying, behold, there's a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, so God is going to display his glory, just Moses can't see it. So he's, he's kind of meeting him part way on this. He's doing as much as he can. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back and my face shall not be seen. So out of love for Moses and concern for his safety, God said no to directly showing his glory to Moses. But he was going to reveal his glory, just Moses couldn't see it. And he did offer an alternative, an alternative that would actually convey to Moses the glory of God without killing him in the process. And the alternative was the goodness of God. So think about what God said he would show him. Next verse, God said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. Not some of my goodness, a bit of my goodness, a sampling of my goodness. I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. So the glory is going to pass by too. Moses can't see that. He'll die. But what he can have revealed to him fully is the goodness of God. And so what's going to follow is the revelation of the fullness, the totality of the goodness of God. Notice what he says, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. And I've put in brackets the reminder that whenever we're reading the Old Testament and we see Lord all in capitals, really that's an antiquated and kind of superstitious way of dealing with the fact that God's personal name is there, and that name is Jehovah, like we sang about in our first song this morning. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. So what he was really saying is I'll proclaim my personal name to you, Jehovah, and I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious and will show compassion on whom I'll show compassion. And then he does exactly that. And here's the key to understanding the idea this morning. Let's look at how God displayed his, the fullness of his goodness. And so what I've done here is I've just pulled Lord out and stuck Jehovah in where it belongs. So we get the idea of this first name basis with God. And Jehovah descended in the cloud and stood there with Moses as Moses called upon the name of Jehovah. It's a first name relationship. And again, remember, we're on a first name basis with God. He's not just God in an abstract way, but he's the personal God, our personal God. And then Jehovah passed by in front of him and proclaimed, Jehovah, Jehovah, a God compassionate and gracious, 
slow to anger, of all the things that God wanted to reveal to Moses about his goodness, the fullness of his goodness, patience. The fruit of the Spirit is patience. And there's that word, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Okay, so you notice the dot, dot, dot there. And if you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, it isn't the next part, but will by no means forgive iniquity and leave sin unpunished, for I'll visit the guilt upon the descendants to the third and the fourth generation. That's true, but that's not the part we're allowed access to. All this we're allowed access to. All this is how we ought to be living. But as far as the bringing judgment on people who do wrong, that's God's prerogative. That's not ours. And so God doesn't call us to bring judgment on the evildoers. So I've stopped it at the point that's going to be applying to us. But it's all these same words again, compassionate, gracious, patient, or slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. <clears throat> and it's all in the context of Moses and God talking on a first name basis. And how many times does God use his personal covenant name with Moses to reaffirm for him that they are in the middle of a personal relationship? Moses, who is doubting his ability to lead the people on into the promised land, God is saying, I'm not just God, I'm your God, and you know me by name, and I've revealed myself to you by name, and we're on a first name basis with each other. And so in effect, then, God is fully showing his goodness by showing that he is love. Um, Martin Luther, in talking about this very verse, calls this God's sermon on his name, where God is teaching us what he is, what he is like. And if we summed up this whole thing, what does it mean to say, God is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness, keeps loving kindness, forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. How about the expression we were reminded of this morning when Deb read from 1 John, God is love. Three words, God is love, and that's ultimately what he's showing here. <coughs> and he, more so, he's not just showing that God is love, but he's teaching us what does it mean to say God is love. Well, what it means is God is not giving us what we deserve because he's compassionate and he's gracious and he's slow to anger. and He's abounding in loving kindness and truth. And he forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. So because God is love, he's not giving us what we deserve. He's giving us what we don't deserve. So how does the fact that God is love manifest itself? Well, how about our call to worship this morning? The Lord, or Jehovah, God, our personal God, is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. See, slow to anger. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. He hasn't given us what we deserve. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. Far as the east is from the west, so point east and kind of pointing north and south, I guess, but point east and west, and your fingertips are pointing in opposite directions, as far as it one direction in infinity is from the other direction in infinity, that's how far God has removed our transgressions from us. They're gone and they're gone forever. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, and he is our heavenly father. So God's love is manifested towards us in that because he's compassionate and gracious and slow to anger, he doesn't give us what we deserve, but he gives us what we don't deserve. And isn't this really the gospel message? That is the gospel message. The gospel is found throughout the Old Testament, and this is exactly how we saw the love of God. Remember that agape love of God defined? So I've just pulled this out of from a couple weeks ago when we looked at fruit of the Spirit is love, from defining for us what the love of God is. Because it's pointless to go and look at an English dictionary, a Greek dictionary, or whatever dictionary to figure out what does love mean when referred to God, because God defines it through his actions. And here's how he defines it. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Romans 5, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And this is exactly the message of Exodus 34, of Psalm 103, and all those other Old Testament passages. And the cross doesn't give us a new message. What it does is it brings to completion or fullness the same old message. And so to bring this, start to bring this towards a close, as we can see, we bear the fruit of the peace of God who dwells in us and who communicates his attribute of peace to us, and more so as God renews us into his image, which reflects his nature as, as love. So the more we're transformed into the image of God in Christ by the working of the Holy Spirit, the more we start to show this. And let's think about how our New Testament, our second reading, our James reading, starts to give us practical steps for doing this. And what I've done 
I got to second guess using this blue to correspond things because blue doesn't look, doesn't work so well from where you're sitting. In Exodus 34, God teaches us about his image. I'll read it again. The Lord passed in front of Moses and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, highlighted that in blue, and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Notice how I pulled out abounding in truth in red. I'll come back to that in a moment. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands and who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sins. So then in James 1.18, we're being told that God is recreating us in his image. So in the exercise of God's will, he brought us forth by the word of his truth. So I want to focus on what's in red right now. When God showed Moses his goodness, the fullness of his goodness, part of it was the fact that he abounds in truth. God is truth. God is full of truth. God's word is true. But think about how this relates to what we're talking about with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. What's another word, another name for the Holy Spirit? How about the spirit of truth? And how did God bring us to faith in Christ? How is God transforming us? By the word of truth. And when we start to dig into that a little bit better, and a little bit fuller when we think about this, Jesus is called the word of God, and we see our relationship with Christ. And how about the spirit of truth? Well, let's go back to the beginning. How does a person come to the point where they become a Christian? How does a person come to salvation? They have to hear or read the gospel message. And how does it get there? The Holy Spirit makes sure they get it. Think about the book of Acts. How many times did we see the Holy Spirit working in a miraculous way to bring the gospel to somebody, for example, standing in a chariot in the middle of the desert? And yet there, that Ethiopian eunuch in the middle of the desert, standing in his chariot, had the gospel brought to him. There's no human barriers for that. So the Holy Spirit brings the gospel to those who God really wants to make sure they get it. We don't have to worry. We throw it out there, and it'll get to where it needs to go. But then there were other times where we saw that the apostles wanted to go into this town or that town and preach the gospel, and the Holy Spirit prevented them, wouldn't let them. So it's the Holy Spirit who brought us the gospel in the first place. It's the Holy Spirit who teaches us the truth of it so that we believe it, we understand it. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of the truthfulness of it, of our need for the gospel message. And so whether it's the word proclaimed from Scripture, whether it's the conviction in the truth of that word and the faith in that word, it's all the outworking of the Spirit of God. We see that in what God said to Moses. We see it in James. Then in verses 19 and 20, we're called to walk in accordance with that image. If God is transforming us into his image, we have to walk accordingly. So verses 19 and 20, This you know, my beloved brethren, but let everybody be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, just like God is slow to anger. Well, why? Partly because we're called to reflect the glory of God, but also simply because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So when we're running around angry and all hot-headed, we are not achieving the righteousness of God. One interesting thing to note, and here's where we kind of get some, some encouraging news on this, this slow to, slow to anger part. James, interestingly enough, doesn't use the word for patience. So you won't find that translated patience in any version of the New, Te in any version of the New Testament. Instead, what he literally says is slow to wrath. And why he is saying that we need to be slow to wrath because the wrath of man does not achieve the righteousness of God is... He's not just talking about our response. He's not saying don't be angry. He's saying don't respond out of your anger. And there's a big difference. Because the Bible tells us it's okay to be angry at times. Think about when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about taking the law to a higher level. He doesn't say if any one of you is angry with his brother, you're guilty of murder. What does he say? He says if any one of you is angry with his brother without reason, is guilty of murder. And that's the idea James has here. It's not the being angry in the first place. It's acting out of that anger. Speaking to spouses, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, and he says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, the angry part, that's fine. We do things wrong to each other. We're going to get angry with each other. But don't let the sun go down on it. In other words, don't let it consume you. Don't act on it. And there's a number of other passages we could look at. But the point is, the Bible's not telling us don't get angry. We just need to make sure we're getting angry over something that is legitimately a cause for anger. <coughs> and that person dawdling along in front of you at the highway going 90 in a 90 zone, that's not a reason to get, to get angry. So when we get frustrated with that person, that's, that's not what they're talking about. What they're talking about is when somebody legitimately does something wrong to you. And yes, be angry. Be angry that you've been hurt. Be angry that somebody has done wrong to you. But don't act out of that. Leave that part to God. Be slow to anger. Be like God. And so as a reminder, and then we'll, we'll close things up, Remember that we have our responsibility along with this, Philippians 2, and we look at this each week, 
So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Again, don't work for your salvation, but rather what God is making you on the inside, live it out. Live as if that's what you are. Make it come out so the world sees it. And how are we able to do this? Because ultimately it's God who's in us, enabling us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. He's giving us the desire. He's giving us the strength. And so as we would read a couple of verses after what the fruit of the Spirit is, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And as we wrap up, James gives us some really simple, maybe not simple to apply, but simple to understand principles for how do we do this? How do we go through life slow to anger? One, embrace the challenge. Our passage started with, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. So the Christian life is not easy. The Bible never says it's going to be easy, and that's including our being slow to anger, and we're going to be tested on that. I was happy I wasn't on the drive-in this morning. I was really expecting a horrible drive-in this morning because that didn't, that didn't materialize. But expect to be challenged on all these things. And ultimately, all the challenges and adversity we face is for our own good. So remember that. Keep that perspective in mind when you're challenged. Secondly, rely on God. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. God is willing to give us all the help we need in our efforts, because he is the working one in us, who will and to do. And then finally, let's keep our eyes focused on where they need to be, the author and finisher of our faith on Christ. And remember, our hope is in eternity, because as James says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. God will bless us in our efforts, and that's what this is saying. And we may never receive complete deliverance from all our trials, tribulations, and sufferings in this life, but it wouldn't be good for us if we did, ultimately. It would just leave us, drive us to complacency. But we do know, and we've read many times, that it, when Jesus returns, he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Everything is going to be made right, and we're going to have an eternity of pleasure in paradise with him. And so we're going to close with this thought. Like James says, rest in God's goodness. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow shifting. So remember the fullness of the goodness of God, the God we know by name, the God who is compassionate and gracious, the God who is slow to anger, abounding loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sins, and even leads us to repentance. So God is love, and as God transforms us more and more into his image in Christ through the Holy Spirit, this will include making us increasingly slow to anger. So our hymn of response this morning is a hymn that talks about God being the working one in us and transforming us, and, what, and it reminds us not to get sidetracked by what we're doing and what we see happening outwardly, but remember our reliance on God, and remember that while we're completely dependent on God, God is completely dependable. Let's stand together and join in singing, I Sought the Lord.